Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who died here, that the nation might live. This we may, in all propriety, do. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have hallowed it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. While it can never forget what they did here, it is rather for us, the living, we here be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve these dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. My guest today is Dr. Brian Dirk. He is a professor of history at Anderson University in Indiana. He is the author of numerous articles and books, including Lincoln and Davis, Imagining America, 1809 to 1865, Lincoln the Lawyer, Abraham Lincoln and White America, Lincoln and the Constitution, and Lincoln in Indiana. In his most recent work, The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death, Professor Dirk goes beyond the characterization of Lincoln as a melancholy, tragic figure to investigate Lincoln's frequent encounters with bereavement and sets his response to death and mourning within the social, cultural, and political context of his times. Of the Black Heavens, Brian Matthew Jordan of Civil War Monitor writes, Dirk's latest effort, the first book-length treatment of the 16th president's long relationship with death, will hardly disappoint those familiar with his prolific scholarship. Students of the 16th president will want to add this concise, thought-provoking, and sensitively written volume to their bookshelves. And we are very pleased to have this accomplished Lincoln scholar with us today. Welcome, Professor Dirk. Well, glad to be here. So the cover of your book has the image of Lincoln. What statue is that exactly? My editor, Sylvia Rodriguez, at Southern Illinois University Press plucked that out of a collection they did of photographs of Lincoln statues. And to be honest, I'm not exactly sure where it's at, but God, it was perfect for that. When she showed me, I was like, that is perfect for this. Well, it's got the rain off of it, you know, that, you know, (laughs) image of tears. Yeah, I read a book about death and we're like, Okay, do we want to have like a black cover or what? You know, something really depressing. <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? You know, so we went back and forth, and then she says, "Let me try this picture." I was like, "Yeah, that works perfectly." Yeah, because it looks like tears, but it's also rain in the expression of face. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great, Professor Dirk. It is tradition here to accompany the discussion with a special brew. Today we have Life and Death IPA from Vocation Brewery 
of Hebden Bridge, West Yorkshire, England. Three kilos of hops and 40 kilos of barley selflessly give their lives to brew every barrel of life and death. It's a lot to ask, but their reincarnation as this life-affirming IPA makes their sacrifice worthwhile. This is a courageous U.S.-style IPA with great tropical and citrus flavors, along with a lingering bitterness set against a smooth, malty backbone. Delicious. I'd like to quickly ask now if you would subscribe to the podcast. Simple click on the subscribe button gets you every new show immediately after it is released. It's the only way to get new shows right away. And of course, I have to say thank you to the listeners from more than 50 countries and hundreds of cities across the United States. And now, I raise my life and death IPA into the Honorable 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. I say cheers. Now, Lincoln was not alone. Your book points this out in experiencing death in the 19th century. John Wood, the founder of Quincy, for example, lost four of his children. But human nature has not fundamentally changed. It still had to be difficult to deal with death as a child. And even though Lincoln's mother had died. His father's really not there. He's not the nurturing type, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I've heard he even had Abraham help nail the coffin shut at his mother's burial. Did the fact that Thomas Lincoln was not an affectionate father and was not really there emotionally for a son have any impact or effect on Abraham Lincoln's view of death or how he dealt with mourning? Well, I'm going to have to use some weasel words here and use probably because. Sure, yes. <laughs> I mean, look, anybody who does any work in Lincoln's life, especially early Lincoln's life, you know, where the sources are so difficult to wade through, you, you have to be very careful about what you say with any degree of certainty. I mean, from what we know about Thomas Lincoln and from what we know about just early 19th century American masculinity, he probably wasn't the type that was going to be emotionally nurturing to get his son through this. The records are barren in suggesting that he did much of anything. I mean, well, Abraham is just sort of in the background for his mother's ordeal, which lasted probably a week if it went like most such ordeals. And there's just a smattering of observations that Lincoln was kind of floating around with his sister, but no indication that Thomas sat down and talked to him or helped him deal with it. I imagine that had a lot to do with how he handled this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think if you ask a child psychologist, they would look at this situation and say, this had to be devastating. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. And in fact, that was one, um, like I said, there's so little actual primary source material on this that I turned to modern literature on child psychology, which you have to apply very carefully, of course, to try to get in the sense of, okay, how does any child deal psychologically with the loss of a parent at an early age? And the suggestions are that children will go in one of several different directions. They might act out, they might fly into a rage, they might break down in tears, or they might just withdraw inwards on themselves. And that latter stage is what I think Lincoln entered, because all of the material that we have on his early life suggests that he wasn't really openly expressing his grief for his mother's death. Could you provide an overview of some of the customs and rituals for mourning, funerals, and burials of the Victorian era? You know, society... (laughs) Wow, how long is this podcast anyway? Yeah, that's a lot of stuff, yeah. Maybe just a a brief a thumbnail, <laughs> Dr. Well, Barrett. okay, yeah. This was a major undertaking for research for this book because the 19th century, you know, death was so intimate. People didn't die normally in hospitals. They really didn't even have funeral homes. Death occurred literally in the home, and they, most people were buried near their homes. People are having death tug at their elbow throughout this period, which means that people developed elaborate rituals and customs to deal with the grieving process. Now, things could vary from region to region, from place to place, you know, town and city, rural, rich and poor and all that. But generally speaking, there was a sense that when you bury a close relative like a child or a sibling or a parent, if you are an adult You probably, if you're a male, wear a black armband or some other form of black wrapping 
the time frame here is very indistinct. Usually only a few weeks, maybe a few months. It depends on where you're at and how close this person was. And then you take it off. You dress rather somberly, that kind of thing. The rituals were far more elaborate and far more developed for women than they were for men. Women were expected to wear what were called widow's weeds, which are basically dressed entirely in black, usually for a very long period of time, like maybe a year sometimes, if a child had been lost or a very close relative. And then you transition to what's called a half mourning, where you could start to wear muted lavenders or muted gray mixed in with the black maybe a brooch that was black or somber. You couldn't wear any jewelry while you're wearing your widow's weed. Then after you transition to half mourning, there was this whole, kind of this social ritual that the people around you were supposed to come to you and say, okay, you've done enough, put all this stuff away, and then you transition to full clothing. But, you know, normal clothing. But you're talking about sometimes as long as a year or two before that actually gets wow. to take place. Wow. Yeah. In regards to his sister, Sarah, Abraham Lincoln had to have depended on her when he was just a boy. They were left, of course, by their father in the wilds of Indiana when Thomas (laughs) went to find his new bride. There must have been a really close connection. And I know that the primary source documents have to be extremely sparse. They are. I mean, they're just kids out on the frontier. There's nothing written down about that. But there must have been a codependence. Oh, I'm sure. And a real closeness between Abraham and Sarah. And even though he had already experienced the death of his mother and some of his other relatives, he didn't handle the death of Sarah very well. What did you learn about his reaction to his sister Sarah's death? I would agree that I'm sure they have had a close relationship, especially since, um, well, I, I'm more positive towards Thomas than a lot of people, but that wasn't one of his finer moments in parenthood when he just says, hey, kids, you stay here in the woods in Indiana. I'll be right back. I'm going to go find another wife. And when he comes back with the new wife, according to everybody, his kids look like they've been living, you know. Lord of in, the Flies you know, or something. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It's like, oh, my God. Can you imagine what they look like? You know. So that's not one of Thomas's better moments, all right? So I imagine that pulled them closer together. You got to kind of sort out the hyperbole from people that knew them back then. But yeah, I think they must have been close, given the fact that they only really had each other for a fairly, you know, traumatic ordeal. When Sarah dies in childbirth after she marries a man named Aaron Grigsby, we don't have a lot of details about that. The child seems to have been stillborn. There may have been some problems with the child exiting the birth canal or something. We have no idea, but they both died. The only record we have of Lincoln's reaction is an eyewitness account that said during the funeral, um, he sat down on a log and sobbed uncontrollably, which is the first recorded instance we have of him displaying emotion right. at his death. There's no, there's no such record of him doing that for his mother, which is not to say it didn't happen. It's just we don't have a record for it, you know? Right. Because, you know, as you know from reading my book and probably other people as well, Lincoln was not a man given to open expressions of emotion like that. No. That's a pretty unusual thing for him. So they must have been close. And the rumor had it for the longest time that Abraham Lincoln was extremely upset with Aaron Grigsby because there was a belief that he had not gotten medical care for his distraught wife until it was too late and that the Grigsby clan had been responsible. In fact, you know, there, there's some bad blood between the Lincolns and the Grigsby's after this. So you mentioned this already. Abraham Lincoln obviously is known as an honest person, even when he's younger, but he's not always emotionally accessible. Yeah, yeah. He finally appears to open up his heart. It's interesting because I think beneath that wall that he puts up is a very soft heart. Oh, I think you're right. When he appears to open that up to Ann Rutledge while living in New Salem, that wasn't easy for him to do. That really must have been bringing down his emotional guard. And then that ends in death and suffering when Anne dies, when she's very young. Is it the string of devastating deaths in his life that have affected his mental or emotional health, which are the subject of so many books? That's a million-dollar question. And it's like, I have to admit, and I imagine there are lots of other Lincoln writers who do the same thing. When someone brings up Anne Relly, you just kind of go, oh, man, what am I going to do with this? You know, because yeah. it's just, <laughs> um, I mean, it is a hugely controversial subject because I mean the fact is and I say this in my book there's so much romanticism and hyperbole and probably exaggeration surrounding their relationship I think they had a romantic relationship 
I suspect that they were probably planning to get married, but then she died. There's all sorts of stories from after the fact. When Billy Herndon goes into Illinois and interviews these people in the 1860s and 1870s, and they all say, oh, my God, Lincoln was blown away. He was devastated. There's this one story that one guy says, Lincoln never carried a pocket knife in his pocket ever after for fear a sudden remembrance of Anne would cause him to injure himself, which, hey, guess what? They found a pocket knife in him after he got shot. Okay, <laughs> right, but I don't yeah. think that's exactly right. But there's still all these stories. So I just kind of said, you know what? We don't know what's true or not, except we think he had a relationship, of course. And of course he was distraught. I try to be careful about that. I, you know, I, the, the records are all secondhand eyewitness accounts years or even decades after the fact. and. Um, I don't really, really feel comfortable in saying, yeah, he had an emotional breakdown. Some people imply that. I don't know that I feel like that's something you can really say, take to the bank. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. The only thing is when he's young and something like that happens, Yeah, like you said, you can't document it or whatever. For someone like Lincoln that's so guarded, that could have been pretty devastating. But of course, you can't figure that out. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it was. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And I don't mean to imply that he wasn't emotionally distraught. What I don't think there's a good record of, though, is that he had some sort of massive emotional breakdown. I mean, who who wouldn't be emotionally distraught if they were planning to marry a young woman and then she up and dies of typhoid fever? I mean, of, of course he was. Whether that, like, unmanned him or caused him to you know, sit in her grave over thunderstorms and weep. I mean, it just sounds kind of something out of a bad Gothic novel. You know, I mean, you have to kind of be careful about some of these stories. Right. But no, I agree with you entirely. I think he certainly was mostly distraught. And I think as he's getting older, I think he's learning to sort of hold that grief inside, but it does come out sometimes. I'm just thinking now that he, of course, is this strong person generally, and he uses humor, which is common. People record that throughout his life. It seems to me that if you have that projection of strength and humor, and then all of a sudden you show sadness, people put an overemphasis on it. Yeah. Of course, he did have issues with melancholy or depression, but it may have been a little bit overstated because how he was normally. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. When he functioned and interacted with people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's plenty of evidence that he used humor, you know, for political reasons. But there's also a quote, I forget who said this. I remember Lincoln saying, I use jokes to, quote, whistle off sadness. So, I mean, that sounds a lot like what you're saying. You know, he uses his humor to counterbalance his, his intense emotional grief. I can totally see that. Now, Lincoln was not a devout follower of organized religion, He does know the Bible very well, though. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. How did his upbringing, and I think he was a separate Baptist, his father was. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. How did that help shape his views of heaven and hell and what happened to the soul when a person died? Well, you know, I was struck by that because the literature on this, there's there's a pretty well-developed literature on the way Civil War era Americans handled death. Ever since Drew Gilpin Faust wrote a book called This Republic of Suffering about 15 years ago, there's a developed literature on how Americans handle death in a time of great dying. And there is this longstanding notion that Americans spoke all the time about the afterlife. There's a huge explosion of literature with Christian writers talking about here's the nature of heaven. This is what it's going to look like. Here's where you're going to see your loved ones. And there's this artwork and there's poetry. There's, a, there's an obsession at the time with the nature of heaven and hell. What I found striking in Lincoln was kind of an absence of that. Right. Yeah, he rarely talks about this. You, you can go digging through his letters and speeches and all that. If the references to heaven or hell, you can count the fingers of one hand. He seems to have taken his early upbringing, that that Baptist upbringing that you're talking about, which had a strong streak of fatalism and sort of Calvinist kind (laughs) of, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen. And there's that one poem he loves that says, fate shapes our our ends, a rough hew them though we will. There's a strong feeling of God is a mystery. We can't try to understand this. And what I suggested is, at least before the Civil War, 
Lincoln hardly talks about heaven and hell all that much in specific terms. And it seems as if he simply believes this is part of God's great unknowable mystery, which dates all the way back to when he's being brought up at Baptist churches by, by his father. You know, you don't know God. You can't know God. This is way too big a mystery. We simply have to bow our heads and accept that death is going to happen without thinking we really know what this means. Yeah, it's it's almost like he, he has that sense of destiny, like something's going to happen yeah. <laughs> and you can't really control it. And that's the aspect that I think seeps through as opposed to anything particular about doctrine or heaven or hell. Oh, absolutely. Totally right. And there's also Shakespeare here. He's a lover of Shakespeare. Right. I'm going to bring him up later. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But, you know, Shakespeare definitely gives him the sense of death as this thing that's going to happen whether you like it or not. And you're going to pay the price, man, for what you've done wrong. You know, I think there's a sense of that as well. Yeah. So Lincoln's son, Eddie, died in 1850, and Mary is inconsolable. And you talked about that's the tradition of the time. And of course, she is very emotional, just an emotional person in general. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Abraham did not seem to normally show any (laughs) open displays of emotion. How did he react to this really prolific outpouring of emotion and visible anguish of Mary? I spent a lot of time with Eddie. In fact, that's actually the first chapter of the book, believe me. I wrote that before I wrote anything else. And I was struck when I was looking through the sources that Lincoln, by this point, you know, he is a aspiring white middle class level lawyer in Springfield, living in a, a respectable home with a respectable profession. And he's got to know that his neighbors are watching, as all neighbors watched other neighbors, whether he dealt with death appropriately, you know, because like I said, there are rules, and there are rituals, and there are customs that you must follow. And from what I've seen of the reliable sources, he was fairly businesslike. And he took a long time to die. Right, yeah. He had probably tuberculosis. He is laying just basically wasting away. Um, in fact, that's why tuberculosis was called consumption back then, because it was a consuming or wasting of the body. Mm. I think Lincoln puts this in a letter. He said, Eddie was sick for 52 days. So he's watching his child die every little bit every single day. Mm. And yet you see no reliable sources of him sobbing or breaking down in tears or all of a sudden showing up at church where he's never there before. The only thing I could see was that he seems to cut back on the number of legal cases that he litigated during that time period compared to that time period in other years. So he's cut back on his business, probably staying a little closer to home. And then he's handling, you know, the, the minutia of, you know, where am I going to bury my son? Where, where do I get a hearse? Who do I get to do this ceremony? The only outburst of emotion I found was an account that after Eddie had died, he walks into the room and he sees a prescription for Eddie's medication. And he just wads it up and throws it away in fury and he's tr- and crying and rushes out of the room. So, but that, that's the only real public display of emotion I think I've, I've seen on him. So after the death of Eddie, and it happened near the near death of his political career, of course it wasn't his yeah, death, yeah. but the near death. Yeah, yeah. Um, did your research find that Abraham internalized his emotions even more, became even more reclusive, maybe part of the reason that he spends all those days out on the legal circuit away from the family? That's a shrewd observation. And you know what? I, I wish I would have thought of that. But I was writing that book. That's really good. No, um, yeah, I, I, I would not be at all surprised um, because there's plenty of evidence from fellow lawyers on the circuit. I ran across this when I was uh, researching my book on his law practice that a lot of people, even his close friends, said, yeah, but we're not that close. You can't get emotionally close to Lincoln. Mm. This is a man who is gregarious. So he knows lots of funny stories. But, I mean, a couple of his close professional friends said, I don't know if I ever really knew him all that well. Nobody did. You know, I, I think even David Davis complains about this. And it's like, you know, he just never opened up to anybody. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a connection with that. I really wouldn't. I like that. What was the view in Victorian times? Not to get, you know, <laughs> weird or anything, but of of ghosts oh. and seances. Oh, my God. And I I know Lincoln couldn't have accepted this, but we know that Mary Todd Lincoln attempted to commune with her deceased sons. So what was the view of that time? And did you uncover anything about Lincoln's view of those things? Uh, oh, man, that's a, you're opening up quite the can of worms here. <laughs> I went at this book, and I had no real opinion about that. I had 
read this or that story that, yeah, Lincoln attended seances. Yeah, Lincoln had seances in the White House. Yes, he believed in ghosts in the afterlife. I just read this in various places. If you, if you get in the internet right now, you'd go find this all over the place, you know. So I, I honestly had no preconceived notions. I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to handle that. So I started looking into it. And what I found was that once you drill down into the sources of people who claim, yeah, Lincoln was in a seance in the White House and he helped a little piano levitate or whatever, you know, once you drill down into those, you find that there are only two types of primary sources upon which those are based. The first are reminiscences of spiritualists themselves who have every reason in the world to basically make this up, you know, particularly a young woman um, who had met him during the war, she claims, and had claimed to hold all these seances in the White House. But those sources, are you, you got to take them with a huge grain of salt because they've got every reason in the world to make this stuff up. The second source that you have for him going to seances and bleeding ghosts are political newspapers, usually of the Democratic Party, who are claiming that Lincoln runs the war because he communes with the ghost of Henry Clay every night in the bedroom or some weird <laughs> stuff like that. And, and again, well, I mean, some of these stories are just hysterical. You know, he apparently supposedly went to a seance in New York where the ghost of Henry Clay talked to the ghost of Stephen Douglas, who talked to the ghost of somebody or the other. And you're like, oh, my God. I mean, some of this stuff even sounds like political satire. Like, like it's really a joke, okay? You know, but when you throw all of that out, you, know, you just say, okay, Maybe this stuff is true. Maybe it's not. I can't rely on it. You toss out all of the spiritualist testimony and all of the political newspaper basically hatchet jobs, you're left with nothing. Lincoln never in any of his letters or papers ever says a word about ghosts. He never says a word about spiritualism. He never says a word about seances. We have a testimony of three fairly reliable people, Ward Hill Lamon, uh, his good friend, uh, John Hay, his personal secretary, and Phineas Gurley, his, um, his minister during the war, all three of them say he was never a spiritualist. He never went to seances. He didn't really believe in ghosts. So I wrote in my book, a chapter of my book, in which I said, as far as Abraham is concerned, there is no reliable evidence that he believed in ghosts. He never talked about ghosts. And I don't know that he ever attended the seance. Now, Mary's a totally different story. Right, yeah. But Abraham, yeah, Abraham doesn't seem to have really believed in any of this stuff. He really doesn't. Yeah, and if you're going to talk to a ghost, I know that he looked up to Henry Clay, but why don't you go all the way back to the man who started? Why don't you go back to Washington or something? Yeah, why, where was George at in all this? Yeah, no kidding. You know, I mean, and then and then when Mary, you know, because Mary does, I mean, she, after Willie dies, you know, first of all, there is no hard evidence that either Abraham or Mary attended any kind of spiritualist ceremony or seance before the Civil War. There's half-baked rumors there are, you know, I knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy kind of stuff, but there's nothing really all that reliable. During the war, when Willie dies, Mary does try to contact spiritualists in the home of a spiritualist family named the Lauries in Washington, D.C. And then she has this guy named Colchester come and do a seance, not in the White House, but in the, the, the soldier's home, the cottage home that they stayed in. And when Lincoln found out about that, he didn't say, oh, goody, Mary, what happened? He goes and has the guy <laughs> investigated. OK, he goes to the president of the Smithsonian and says, you look into this guy, because he's a con artist, which he was. So Mary's a different story entirely. Like I said, she's very emotional. Willie's death shatters her in a way Eddie's really didn't. You know, it was that bad. Abraham, not so much. Well, the world knows that Lincoln is an excellent public speaker, and he's a fairly good poet, actually, too. He is. But he wrote very few eulogies in his life. Did those eulogies that he did write help you better understand his view in death and dying? Uh, yes and no. He didn't write that many eulogies. He wrote one for a member of the Temperance Society in Springfield, a man he didn't seem to really even know all that well. It sounds like something that somebody kind of talked him into doing. He did a eulogy for Andrew Jackson that, again, I, I think he did it more for political reasons. Then the most famous eulogy that he wrote was for Henry Clay. Right. What the point I'm making in the book is that eulogies are political documents back then. You know, eulogies are usually fairly long, elaborate kind of celebrations of the death of usually you know fairly well-known people and are used by the person writing the eulogy to say, hey, I was, you know, here's my values. 
that are hooked onto this dead person. And that's what very much what he did with Henry Clay. If you go read Henry Clay's eulogy, Lincoln in many ways is sort of using Henry. Remember, he writes that right when he's coming back out of the political wilderness and getting back into politics in 1854. And he writes that eulogy as a way to, oh, by the way, here are my views on slavery. They look just like Henry Clay's. We all admire Henry Clay. And the, the subtle message there is, I'm on the right side of Henry Clay. May he rest in peace. You have a chapter in your book on Elmer Ellsworth, who had studied law in Lincoln's office and was a favorite of Mary and the Lincoln children. What was the impact of his death on Abraham Lincoln and the view of the war at that point? Oh, huge. And I, you know what? This is something else that I really didn't know I was going to spend this much time with. But I ended up doing an entire chapter on it because Elmer Ellsworth was one of the first real combat deaths of the Civil War. If you want to call it a combat death, he gets, you know, he gets blown away by an old man who doesn't want to steal his flag, you know. But still, it's one of the first combat deaths of the Civil War. At that point, very, very few people had died during the war. And in fact, most Americans, Lincoln included, didn't really have much in the way of a personal connection with what war does. It kills young men. Elmer Ellsworth is a nationwide figure. You know, he um, had led this famous drilling company that did these elaborate rifle drills. They demonstrated before President Buchanan, before the war in the White House lawn. Everybody knew him. He's young, he's handsome, he's super athletic. He's the kind of guy that you would look at and go, oh, that guy's like a good kill. He's too good. <laughs> you know, he's like a die. You know, because remember, this is the war hasn't done Gettysburg yet or Antietam yet. You haven't seen thousands and thousands and thousands of dead bodies. So when Elmer Ellsworth, who's personally known to Lincoln, I mean, he's part of Lincoln's bodyguard on the way to Washington, D.C., he gets killed. It just, it just brings it home, man. You know, so I hear oh my God, he, because he, this guy gets a, a hole blown in his chest and he dies in an ugly agony. It just registers with Lincoln, along with the death of his friend Edward Baker not long afterwards. Hey, this is the real deal. You know, these people are going to die here. You know, it just, it just puts death right in his face. And, you know, Ellsworth was laying in state in, in the White House. He was given the kind of funeral you normally give senators, that kind of thing. And it was reported that Lincoln couldn't conduct business for several days after Elmer died. So Lincoln's favorite poem was Mortality by William Knox, and he has specific choices for Shakespeare that he likes. Does his preference of literature offer you any insight into his view of his own mortality? Yeah, I, I, I did quite a bit with that, actually, because, and then you mentioned earlier, of course, that he himself wrote poetry, some of it fairly dark. I mean, if um, you read the poem that Lincoln wrote when he visited his mother's grave in Indiana. It's full of imagery of death and loss. And of course, Knox is just downright dour. He's, you know, he's a dour Scotsman, you know, that kind of thing. And then with Shakespeare, it, it's hard to tell sometimes which plays he did and didn't read, but the ones that we definitely know he read tended to be the Shakespearean tragedies, Macbeth, um, you know, that kind of thing where death is the specter that is the great leveler of people who have done wrong and the idea that you will die someday and there will be some sort of rough divine justice meted out to the good and the wicked. Did you see any emotional maturation of Abraham Lincoln and how he dealt with the death, earlier deaths, son Eddie, for example, and how he dealt with the death of his son, Willie. So is there any maturation or development on how he dealt with death between those two? Well, you know, that's a really great question. We have better records, first of all, for what happened to Willie than what happened to Eddie. You got to remember, when Eddie dies in 1850, he's, Eddie passes away in the Lincoln home in Springfield. I mean, there are eyewitnesses, of course, but Willie dies in, you know, what's basically, you know, the fishbowl of the White House. There's much more much more information. There were more eyewitness accounts of how Lincoln reacted. As far as maturity, yes, I, I think I think what Lincoln had learned to do by the time Willie died was to put a brave public face on the death. Because after all, he's president at that point. He's in the middle of a great civil war. What struck me about Lincoln and about Mary, and this is another point that people tend to forget, we all know, I think, the stories about their grief behind the scenes. One of his private secretaries, I forget whether it's Hay or Nicolay, recounts that Lincoln walks into his office and says, well, 
my boy is gone. He was too good for this earth. He's gone, and he rushes out crying. And Elizabeth Keckley, the seamstress who is Mary's best friend, talks about Lincoln breaking in great sobs when he sees Willie's bedroom and all of that. That all happened behind the scenes. Those stories weren't really known at the time. If you look at the press coverage of Willie's death, they were talking about Lincoln being a grieving father. They're talking about him being a, you know, a distraught. But there's no stories in the press at the time. Hey, Lincoln's about to lose it. Well, for that, Mary, Mary's about to lose it. We all know Mary was close to emotionally just shattering over this. There's the famous story where she's laying in bed and she's just bawling forever. And Lincoln finally walks in and draws the curtains to the room aside and points to the insane asylum and says, if you don't get control of your grief, we may have to send you there. But that stuff all happens in private. So I think, yes, he does learn, and Mary does too, to keep this under wraps. Because in the outside world, a few people knew just how extreme their emotion was. Can I go back to his childhood for one second? I just had this thought. Sure. In terms of death, I know you don't have a chapter on the turkey, but when he was a, <laughs> you know, when he was a kid, uh-huh. you know, it's it's revealing to me that he shoots this bird, and the feeling of watching the turkey die empties him out a little bit, so he doesn't really do it again. It just seems to be revealing to me about how he viewed life and death. Oh, I totally agree. And in fact, I, I did discuss this a bit in. My first chapter in the book in which I talked about the ways he encountered death as a child wasn't just his, his family. And he lived at a time when hunting was considered to be pretty much a universal pursuit for a young boy. You go look at the records of other young boys growing up in Indiana. They're all out there hunting bears and wolves and deer and turkeys and whatnot. But yet, according to the accounts we have, he shot a turkey one day. And I think he even, I think this is even Lincoln himself, his later words said, I never since pulled a trigger on any such game. In other words, when he killed that turkey, he was done. He wasn't, he, he didn't hunt. And that was really odd because most kids actually kind of did that kind of thing. There's another story that he sternly lectured his stepbrother for torturing and, and killing a turtle, saying they're all God's creatures and all of that. And then later on in life, there's stories from him in New Salem where he was kind of on the squeamish side. He just, yeah, he was he was extraordinarily sensitive to death and dying. And yeah, I, I could see that with the turkey, absolutely. So making a little connection to today, mm-hmm. most Americans were not ready for the amount of battlefield deaths during the Civil War. In regards to the view of war comparing society in 1860 to today, mm-hmm. do modern images of violence, say actual footage of war, for example, I guess, even death on TV or in video games, do people today understand death and war a little better than they did in the 19th century because of that? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, at the time when the Civil War breaks out in 1861, the last major war in America, in American history, had been the war with Mexico 15 years previously. And most of the death and dying had taken place far away from, from people you know, where they lived. Photography was still in its infancy. You can't underestimate the power of the images that we, you know, you and I and all of us in modern America have grown up with. You know, I've seen some of that grisly footage of bloodshed in Vietnam, you know, the TV war footage. There's also a strong tradition of American anti war literature that dwells on the human cost of war, Apocalypse Now and uh, Platoon and Saving Private Ryan and all of these films and artwork and all this in our modern consciousness, we got to remember Americans in 1861, and this would include Abraham Lincoln, they just, they didn't know what this was going to be like. This many dead people right in front of them, they just had no idea. I'm thinking now of a few images of wartime presidents, LBJ with McNamara, and he's leaning his head back, and McNamara's got his his head in his hands, seemingly exasperated during a cabinet meeting. Uh Then you have FDR, normally always projecting an image of optimism, even in the darkest days of World War II. How would you compare Lincoln to any of the other presidents in history on how he dealt with war and battlefield deaths? Well, this, this is actually how this entire book got started. 
originally that was going to be the focus of the book. I was going to look at his presidential leadership during the wilderness campaign. And then I started asking, you know, larger questions. That's right at the heart of the matter. What I found was that early in the war, I'd say from about the war's outbreak in April 61 to uh, maybe fall of 62, Lincoln stumbles a bit. He doesn't really fully grasp his role as sort of the interpreter in chief of the meaning of the battlefield dead. I make an argument in the book that first of all, I think he's distracted. Okay. He's distracted by the death of Elmer Ellsworth. He's distracted by the death of Edward Baker, who's a good friend of his who dies at Battle of Ball's Bluff. And he's distracted by the death of Willie. He's got personal grief that he's having to wrestle with. You strain to find mention in these early speeches and public pronouncements through the first part of the war of him to say anything about, well, okay, here's why we're dying. Here's the point of all of this. Here's what the reasoning is. What I saw was, though, and this is what I've always admired in Lincoln, his ability to grow, you know, his ability to learn. And you, you almost see it as the war continues. He starts to figure out, hey, wait a minute. If I'm not careful, other people are going to interpret battlefield death, and that's going to be in ways not to my liking. And you start to see, especially by sort of the middle of the war, about the time he starts to embrace emancipation, and then, of course, as he starts to embrace the great speeches of his presidency, Gettysburg, and then towards the end, the Second Inaugural Address, he's figuring it out. I have to tell Americans, this is why people died. This is why you lost your son. This is why you lost your dad, man. This is why this happened. And it's, it's really admirable to see him stumble in the first days of the war, not really understand what he needs to do, but then he starts to grasp, I've got to take control of this. Are there many letters left of Lincoln writing to families who had lost loved ones in the Civil War? There are very few. That was something that, um, I, again, I had no particular opinion about one way or the other. I mean, I was always familiar, of course, with things like, you know, the Bixby letter and all that. But I'm just curious, how many times did he actually write to families? And it's very few. Wrote the famous letter to uh, Mrs. Bixby, who lost five sons. Or, or he thought he lost five sons. I think she only lost two, but that's a whole other story. But he also wrote another letter to a young woman whose father had died in the war, and the father had been um, a clerk in one of the courts that Lincoln practiced in in Illinois. And there's not much else. There's no mechanism like, say, FDR had where if a, a soldier died in World War II, uh, their family would get a telegram. Or later on during Vietnam and during the Gulf Wars, there would be written missives sent out to grieving families. That just didn't exist, I think, largely because the number of deaths had grown so large and so unmanageable that they just didn't have the mechanism for Lincoln to communicate that way. Yeah, I've been in the Army for 27 years. I'm currently in the Reserves. Oh. There's a particular, very specific process that gets started if a soldier dies in any way. Oh, sure. The chaplain and another soldier, generally of equal or higher rank, go out and inform someone in public. They stay with the individuals right. until their grieving initially is, is over. And then the Army assigns someone to the family to carry them through the entire process and that can last months. Wow. So I know it's different than the past, but that's currently how it works. Wow. Well, that's really great. And it doesn't matter how the soldier dies. It doesn't have to be in combat. So that's just how it works today. Well, we've learned some things, I think. Going back to the scholarship of uh, Drew Gilpin Faust and some other scholars who've studied this, we don't realize some crazy high percentage. I've seen estimates as high as 30 to 40% of the families of Civil War dead never knew what actually happened to their loved ones. There was, there was no mechanism for systematically informing the families of the dead. Very often, the letters just stopped arriving, and then they heard that that particular regiment had been in this horrific fight. And then if they're lucky, somebody in the regiment compiled a list of the people who died, and it makes its way to the newspapers and that kind of thing. I mean, it's very haphazard. They just don't have a system. Are there any letters out there that Lincoln wrote to black families or any documents that show his reaction to the death of, say, black soldiers Ooh. as opposed to white soldiers? Boy, that's a great question. I've never seen anything like that per se. I do know that he was very solicitous 
of the sacrifice of African American soldiers, and he expresses this in numerous cases. And he also really grew upset when he heard about the uh, Fort Pillow massacre in Tennessee when Confederate soldiers slaughtered black men who were trying to surrender. He was very angry about that. And when he had heard that Union recruiters were abusing black men and forcing them into uniform, he wrote letters to stop that. So he did very much care about what happened to black soldiers. And in fact, the fact that black soldiers were willing to die on the battlefield for their freedom had a profound effect on how Lincoln viewed African Americans generally. Was Lincoln, because of his use of humor, even in very difficult and dark times, ever criticized for being too callous or uncaring? (laughs) You must have read my book. Yeah, yeah, I I just, um, um, yeah, I I, I got to ask these questions, Dr. Durr. I I am impressed. No, 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 it's just the reason I said it is I had barely heard of this scandal that took place after the Battle of Antietam because what happened was. Everybody knows Lincoln visited the battlefield of Antietam after the battle had taken place. This is pretty famous stuff. There's photographs of Lincoln with McClellan and all that stuff. But what I didn't know about until I started doing the research, or didn't know very much about, was he had gone to that battlefield. And while he was on the battlefield, they're traveling from one part of the battlefield to the other in like uh, an ambulance, you know, one of the wagons he's carried the, the wounded in. And he's with Fort Hill Lamon, who was a good close friend and a couple of other men in there. And, and, and Lincoln's in a very despondent mood. And he, he asks Lamon, just sing a couple of, of funny songs just to kind of cheer him up. And Lamon does, because they know these songs from back in the day. When he gets back, there's all of these rumors in the press that Lincoln had insisted that Lamon seeing humorous, joking songs while he was literally standing on the dead bodies of soldiers. And I mean, the, it, it's like it's like a game telephone we used to play when we were a kid. You know, by the time you get from one end of the line to the other, it's completely out of hand. There were these stories that he's picking his way among the dead and groaning soldiers, singing, as, as the press put it, ribald Negro songs. There was an underlying race factor in that. And there's all of these editorials. Well, we all know that Lincoln's just a jokester and a prankster. He doesn't take the dying of his own people seriously. There were even songs written about Lincoln. The jokester-in-chief in the White House cracked jokes while your son died on the battlefield and all that. And it came up again in the 1864 election. And Lincoln was horrified. In fact, he even got Lamon to write out a response that Lincoln was going to put into the press in which Lamon was going to say, hey, There were no dead bodies anywhere to be seen. We came there three weeks after the battle was over. Lincoln was not asking me to sing ribald joke songs. He felt depressed. I was trying to cheer him up. So, yeah, it did get him in trouble. And, in fact, this was one of the bigger scandals of the war. And people don't realize, we all think of Lincoln as this reverential figure standing at the Gettysburg Cemetery and speaking his great words. But before that happened, he was raked over the coals by the press as just this dude who cracks jokes while people are dying. So in terms of that, obviously there's been multiple books written on the Gettysburg Address. Did you lean on that at all? Did you use that for insight into how he viewed war deaths? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I read Gary Wills a long time ago and uh, Gabor Boritz, just outstanding book. Uh, Gettysburg Gospel. I mean, there's just a, a huge literature. In fact, I don't really think I, think I say anything terribly original in my handling of that speech. Basically, what I argue is that Lincoln at that point is the mature Lincoln who understands that he has to act as an interpreter for what had happened on that hallowed ground. And that, as you point out earlier, he knows his Bible very well. He knows how that language and that imagery resonates with the American public. And more generally, he is making that journey that you see concluded in the second inaugural of saying the death and the dying is not really in my hands. It's in the hands of this unknowable God that we've talked about earlier that, you know, he doesn't really know God's will. In the Gettysburg Address, he's, he's tying the death uh, to, you know, experiments in democracy and this hallowed sacred ground. He's, he's learning how to tell Americans this is the meaning of what we've all experienced. How about the second inaugural? Did you use that at all? Oh, yeah. He has this one comment that I always look back to, and I tie it to today, where he says, and I'd have to paraphrase, but 
if every ounce of blood shed by the whip is then reciprocated with the sword. Right, right. It's almost like he understands this is our punishment right. for the original sin of slavery. Oh, yeah. And oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, imagine the political courage it took for somebody to stand up and say that. Most presidents would have stood up in front of that audience at that point and just kind of said, oh, yeah, we win. You know, do my touchdown dance, spike it in the end zone. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, he's, you know, in, in that quote, and really in the entire speech, there's a tone of melancholy and a tone of sadness. And there is this sense that I have never really been in control of the death and dying, that there's a greater will in charge here. You know what? I really think it's the only way that he could keep his psyche intact. Because, you know, that old sign that Harry Truman kept on his desk sure, in the sure. White House, the buck stops here. And well, dude, the buck really stopped with Lincoln. He was at the top of the responsibility pyramid, okay? If you have a Union soldier who shoots a Confederate soldier, he'll just say, well, my sergeant ordered me to do it. And the sergeant will say, well, my captain ordered me to do it, and so on. Well, that travels up to Lincoln, but he can't do that. You know, he can't say, hey, you know what? If somebody else told me to order you guys to all die here at Gettysburg. The only way for him to preserve his sanity is to say, I'm not even in control. It is the Almighty that's in control of this. And we're all just as humble servants, whether we believe whatever the moral content of the war is, he is the one that exacts justice, whatever it might be. You know, every time there's a racial spasm, which we recently had this summer, and then, of course, I would say the storming of the Capitol. Oh, indeed. I always think of that first. It's almost like we're still paying. And Lincoln probably would say, you're still paying for that original sin. He'd be nodding his head, I think, at this point. I really do. And, you know, the thing about that speech, I can't tell you the number of times over the last few weeks that I've seen everybody from all from the entire political spectrum, quote, with malice towards none. You know, why can't we all get along with malice towards none and all that? And that's fine. But people forget that it, there's a real moral clarity in that speech uh, with what you said. This is this is a judgment for an American sin. He didn't embrace moral relativism. I mean, he says it clearly in that speech, all knew that slavery was somehow the cause of the war. He doesn't say, oh, well, nobody was really right or wrong here. We're all brave men. He says, no, this was wrong, and we were all involved in this, and this is a national sin, and we are all responsible. Lincoln had some very famous dreams, possibly predicting his own assassination. Did you review the accounts of his dreams in your research? I know that's a challenge for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and do they reveal anything about his view of death and dying? I've had that question come up several times because there's this one account of Lincoln, I, believe, I forget exactly when he said this, it was sometime during the war, in which he told a, about a dream that he's walking through the White House and it's filled with people and he knows it's a funeral and in the dream he goes over to someone and says, what has happened here? And they respond, the President of the United States has been shot. He's basically prefiguring his own death. I'm not saying that account is false. I'm just saying it's a little too cute by half. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's a post-war reminiscence that maybe somebody's memory playing tricks with them, that they think they heard Lincoln's talk about this kind of a dream. We don't know one way or the other. We do know that he did believe that dreams could have portents because there's a letter he writes to Mary Lincoln when Mary is shopping somewhere up north with Tad. And he writes her a quick letter, and he says, tell Tad to put that toy gun we gave him away. I had an ugly dream about it last night. So we do know, and, and those are his own words, so they're quite trustworthy. I ended up not putting any of the dream accounts in because almost none of them come from him personally. Is there any record of what Lincoln wanted for, say, his funeral or his final burial location or anything like that? from the historical record. No, and you know what? What's shocking is he died intestate. I've always wondered about that. He, he didn't leave a will, and you would think a man He's a lawyer. law. <laughs> yeah, right. 24 years at the bar. How many cases did he litigate that were a hot mess because somebody didn't leave a will behind, you know? I've just always been really surprised by that, you know, that he did. He dies intestate, which causes Mary some serious headaches after he's shot. So, no, he, he never 
he never said anything about where he wanted to be buried. He never said anything about his own funeral or death. He was famously nonchalant about assassination attempts, and that and there's ample record of that. But there just doesn't he doesn't seem to have ever thought much about his his own death. The closest thing I can think of right offhand is Harry Beecher Stowe met him in the White House during the war. And she said, Mr. President, do you have any idea what you're going to do after the war? And she said he had this sad smile. And he says, after the war, I don't think I'm going to see an after the war. This war is killing me. That's about the closest we've seen. So the last question I have, and through your study and how Lincoln had handled or viewed death, can we learn anything for us personally that the individual can apply from Lincoln's example? Oh, yes. I think, I mean, I've spent a lot, of, a lot of years with Abe. I think after writing nine books on the man, I'm on a first name basis with him, I think, you know. So, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've learned quite a bit. I find appealing his unwillingness to claim he knows what God wants when it comes to death and dying. And, you know, you, you never see him say during the war, he does interpret the death but he doesn't say, I know exactly what God wants. He's humble. And I think his humility in the face of the death and dying is something we could all learn from. Because very often, especially during wars, we want so desperately to find meaning in the dead that we tend to get kind of arrogant about it and think we know exactly why people are dying. Lincoln never really did that. He did tie dying to saving democracy and atoning for the for the sins of slavery. But even in the second inaugural, he says, the quote you mentioned, you know, if this is the justice being meted out to us, all we can do is just bow our heads and 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 and, and pray for God's will. There's there's a, there's a mystery to God's will that He preserves when He's facing death. And I think we could all use a goodly dose of that. Well, thanks, Professor Dirk. I really enjoyed it. I can talk about Lincoln all night. It's so much fun. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to come back and talk about Lincoln the lawyer, because we got a lot of lawyer listeners out there, and I think that'd be entertaining. I would absolutely love to. That was the first, you know, sort of book people tend to know me by, so I would love to do that. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again. Cool. I would like to thank my guest today, Lincoln scholar, Dr. Brian Dirk. If you would like to get his book, The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death, just click on the link in the description below. Dirk paints a vivid and compelling portrait of a commander-in-chief who buried two sons and gave the orders that sent an unprecedented number of Americans into battle. And it is a great read. The featured brew was Life and Death IPA from Vocation Brewery. If you liked our discussion today, Please share this episode with a friend. All of the directories have an easy-to-use sharing function. If you aren't a current subscriber, remember, hit the subscribe button and get new episodes immediately after they are released. The music was provided by the great band Bones Fork. And finally, to the growing list of supporters and listeners from 50 countries and hundreds of cities across America, I need to say once again, thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way with conversations about Robert E. Lee and the Lost Cause, Branch Rickey's Redbirds, P.T. Barnum and the extraordinary performers who transformed the Victorian age, and the history of the world-famous Anheuser-Busch Brewery. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. This mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Mm